Welcome. Thank you for joining me for this class on River Friendly Living, working together to care for the Truckee River. This program is brought to you by One Truckee River with funding provided by the Truckee River Fund and the Western Regional Water Commission. My name is Carrie Jensen, and I'm a landscape architect and environmental educator for Urban Ecology Solutions, and I'm here today representing One Truckee River. I wanted to start off with some facts about the Truckee River. The first is one that you might be very well aware of. That is that the Truckee River is the heart and center of our community. The second is that the Truckee River provides drinking water to almost half a million people. This you might be aware of, maybe not. And then the third fact is one you probably are not well aware of. That is that sections of the Truckee River have been designated impaired for not meeting Clean Water Act water quality standards. And that is why One Truckee River is working together with a lot of partners in our region to ensure a healthy, thriving, sustainable river connected to the hearts and minds of its community. As the name suggests, we're all working together as one to help protect the Truckee River, hence the name One Truckee River. We're working under a management plan that was approved by the cities of Reno, Sparks, and Washoe County in 2016. This management plan has a lot of different objectives and goals for the Truckee River and how to manage it. And we're not gonna go through all of those today, but we are gonna cover two in particular. The first is goal number one, to ensure and protect the water quality and ecosystem health of the Truckee River. And another goal, goal three, is to build an aware and engaged community that protects and cares for the river. And how are we meeting those goals? Well, we're trying very hard to meet them with this new education initiative that we've just started. It's called River Friendly Living, where we're trying to teach everyone in our community about how we can all work together to help care for and protect the Truckee River. There are many ways that we can do that through our individual actions, also in the practices in our yards by implementing river friendly yards, and also by using our voices and hands to help get out different messages in the community and speak up for the river when we can. You might be thinking, why do we need river friendly living? Well, if we back up really far and think about the big perspective when it comes to water quality, we can look at the earth as a whole and we might think, oh, there's an awful lot of water <laughs> on the planet earth. So why would we have problems with water? But it, as you're probably all really well aware, learned when we were back in elementary school, the majority of water on Earth is salt water that is in the oceans. Only 3% of water on Earth is fresh water, and the majority of that is either captured in glaciers or in underground water sources. Less than 1% is in rivers and lakes that it's easy for us to access for drinking water sources. And what is the local situation? Well, we live in the state of Nevada. It is the driest state in the United States. So we can see here from this graphic, the redder colors are the drier. And as the majority of the state is in the red, it's pretty obvious. And our average precipitation levels here in the Truckee Meadows are about seven inches per year. We are also in our state located within the greater Great Basin watershed. And this is a special watershed we'll talk more about because it doesn't flow out to the ocean. And locally here, we are in a sub watershed that is the Truckee River watershed. <laughs> Just to make sure we all know, you might be wondering, what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land where all of the water drains to one location. It's how it sheds off the land and goes to one spot. A really simple way to think about that is as a natural bathtub, with the rim of the bathtub being the ridgeline of a mountain range, the sides being all the streams that come off of that range, and the bottom of the bathtub being where all the water drains to. And in our local watershed, the Truckee River watershed, the rim of the bathtub really starts up at Lake Tahoe, with all of the snow melt that comes off the Sierra Nevadas drains into Lake Tahoe. And then it has only one outlet, which is the Truckee River, which brings the water and all that snow melt down from Lake Tahoe to the eastern side of the Sierras here for us in the Truckee Meadows. It provides about 85% of our drinking water here. 
and provides water source to almost half a million people, as we talked about in the beginning. Then the Truckee River flows out the bottom of the bathtub, essentially, is Pyramid Lake. And Pyramid Lake is particularly special because it doesn't drain out to the ocean, as we talked about. This is called a closed or endorheic basin. And because it is such a small water body that doesn't drain anywhere else, it has the potential for pollutants to build up very quickly. We can have water quality impacts that build up over time. And some other areas of our watershed that are also included that sometimes people don't realize include places like uh, Washoe Lake that drains into the Truckee River, as well as some areas of Spanish Springs. So I'm just going to overview the map of the Truckee River watershed once again, so you can kind of put that all together in your head. All of the water drains mostly up from Lake Tahoe down through the Truckee Meadows and out to Pyramid Lake. And how is our watershed changing? Well, as you can see from this graphic here, on the right, we have the entire watershed, and I've blown up the Reno Sparks area, the Truckee Meadows, and noted in the pink, urban development. So we've had an awful lot of urban development in the last couple of decades. And with that urban development comes this thing called impermeable surfaces, which is just a really fancy way of saying a lot of asphalt and concrete. And when we think about impermeable surfaces or asphalt and concrete, we really usually think about really urban areas where there's lots of it, such as downtown. But there's also lots of impermeable surfaces in our suburban developments as well when you think about all of the street networks that connect those communities. And there are some water quality impacts that can occur when we have more impermeable surfaces. So in a general sense, I have this graphic here from the EPA to kind of explain. On the left, we have a natural area that is forested. When we have a precipitation event, majority of the water is either evapotranspirated and used by the plants and put back up into the atmosphere, or it's able to infiltrate down through the soil. Very little water actually runs across the surface of the land. Conversely, on the right, we have an urban scenario where we've put all this asphalt and concrete down. And now when we have precipitation events, there's not the ability for that water to infiltrate into the soil. There may be less vegetation and less evapotranspiration. And thus we have a lot more water that runs across the surface. This is called urban runoff. And because we need somewhere for that water to go, we don't want it to flood, right? If we don't have a place for that water to drain away, every time it rained, our cities would flood. So engineers have put in a system called the storm drain system that takes the water from storms on the streets and drains it away so we don't have flooding. That system goes into a series of pipes underground and then is directed out to local waterways. That could be the closest local creek and eventually they all flow out to the Truckee River in our area in our watershed. This is different from the sanitary sewer system. The sanitary sewer system is all the water that goes down like your sinks and your toilet inside your house, those go down into a separate pipe system that takes that water out to a treatment plant where it is then cleaned before it is discharged. And in our local area, the biggest one is in East Sparks and they treat the water there before it is discharged back into the Truckee River. The big difference between these systems is that the water in the sanitary sewer system gets cleaned, whereas the water in the storm drain system does not. And most people don't realize they are separate and different. So when all of that water goes down those drains, there, and this is what a typical storm drain can look like on the side of the street. I just kind of want to emphasize, most people don't think about it, but all these concrete curb and gutters that flow that storm water into those drains, those are essentially concrete creeks where the water eventually does flow out to the Truckee River. So even though you probably don't think about them as a creek, they essentially are from an ecological standpoint, from the Truckee River standpoint, they're like not very different from a local creek because they bring water to it when it rains. And there's some impacts associated with that water draining out. The first impact is called non-point source pollution, which is kind of a mouthful. It essentially just means so it's sources of pollution that come from many different locations. They're not just from one place. So some examples of that are oil, antifreeze, um, all the different chemicals that could potentially leak from your car, 
as well as soaps, which contain phosphates. If we wash our cars in driveways or in parking lots, those can wash off. Trash and litter, those are another classic example of non-point source pollutants that come from all over the place. They're not just from one spot. Pet waste is another example, and this can include E. coli, salmonella, and other bacteria and viruses that can be very dangerous to have flush into our drinking water source. Another non-point source pollutant that you're probably familiar with but didn't realize is one that is brought to the attention by the Keep Tahoe Blue campaign. And this is sediments. Sediments are essentially just loose pieces of soil or dirt that flow into waterways. And even though they are a natural substance, when they concentrate in waterways, they can cause pollute or can be considered pollutants because they increase the turbidity of the water, which means it decreases the clarity. It also increases temperature as well as decreases oxygen levels, smothers fish eggs, causes all kinds of problems for aquatic health. And in Lake Tahoe, it has become a particularly big issue because we want to maintain the historic clarity of the lake. And when we have sediments that wash in, it decreases that clarity. But it doesn't just affect Lake Tahoe, it affects, affects the entire watershed, as well as most of the waterways in the US. Some other non-point source pollutants to consider are nitrogen and phosphorus that can come from synthetic fertilizers, especially if those are applied in excess on our landscapes. And then we turn on our sprinklers. If the vegetation has not used those fertilizers, then they can easily dissolve into the water on, from an irrigation system, wash down that curb and gutter system, and go down the storm drain. When nitrogen and phosphorus from those synthetic fertilizers hits local waterways, it can cause algae blooms. Basically, the algae go crazy. They grow very quickly. And then when they start to die off, it sucks oxygen out of the water and can cause fish die off as well as die off of other aquatic species. And there can be buildup of toxins in the water from the algae blooms, which can make it unsafe for us to recreate in or our pets to play in. There's also the potential of non-point source pollution from fertile, or not just fertilizers, but also pesticides applied on our landscapes. And often pesticides that are used in home yard kind of scenario are ones that are broad spectrum which means that they don't just kill a specific species like a cockroach you're trying to get rid of, but they may have effects on many different species at once. And those can include beneficial insects such as bees, butterflies. And one that we probably don't think about are our aquatic macroinvertebrates like this mayfly. So if those pesticides wash down the storm drain and out into our rivers, they can cause die off or detrimental effects to these species as well. And they're really important because they're the bottom of the food chain for all of our aquatic ecosystems. They support the fish, which are really important in our local region. Another impact that we need to think about with our storm drain system is stream incision. And this is one you're probably not as familiar with, so I'll walk you through it. Take you back to this picture of the storm drain. And I want you to think about a really big storm event, particularly in the summer where we get like a big downpour. And all of that water moves very quickly, goes down all those pipes and rushes out to our local waterways. It's a large volume moving very quickly. And then when it hits a natural stream bank, it can cause erosion. And it can essentially get, make the stream banks erode so that they're vertical like this. This is a very extreme example, um, not local. It's actually in San Jose, California. You can see here, this hydrologist is standing down in a creek and he's about six feet tall. This creek has eroded very deeply with these steep side banks, which are not natural. In a natural stream scenario, we would have a low flow channel as shown here and then we would have healthy floodplains on either side. So when we have a storm event, the water can rise up onto the floodplains. And then it supports a lot of vegetation on the sides of our streams and creeks. This is called riparian vegetation or water loving plants that live in these systems where they get that water from the floodplain. 
and they support lots of different wildlife and help shade the creek and support a healthy temperature for fish and other aquatic species, so they're really important. But when we have all this water that flushes down in a storm event and goes down the storm drain, then it can erode those banks so that they get really deep and those natural floodplains disappear. Now the floodplain is left up very high and those trees or riparian vegetation can no longer access the water. Their roots don't go that deep and you can get die off of those riparian species along the river. And here's just an example showing it's not very extreme incision, but a little bit of bank erosion and how the roots of those riparian trees begin to be left high and dry and not able to access the water as quickly or as easily. And especially when it gets really deep, then they can't access it at all and they start to die off. And then we have a very unhealthy river system, essentially. Sometimes hydrologists call this urban stream syndrome. So now we've talked about the impacts of our storm drain system, the pollutants, as well as stream incision. Now let's talk about what we can do to help with these problems and help protect the Truckee River. There are individual actions that we can all take every day that can help protect the river from afar. One of the big ones is to reduce our transportation impacts by making sure that we properly maintain our cars so that we don't have oil spills and leaks that could contribute non-point source pollution to the river. If we do have an oil leak, you can use kitty litter to help absorb that and then scoop it up and put it into the trash can so that that doesn't leach out into the storm drain. We can also make sure that we maintain our cars and take them to the car wash instead of washing them in, at our homes in the driveway because in the driveway, the phosphates from the soaps can easily wash out. Whereas if you take your car to the car wash, there the drains go into the sewer system where those phosphates are cleaned out. Another thing to think about when it comes to transportation or our vehicles are brake pads. So historically brake pads had a lot of copper in them. And every time you break little tiny bits of those copper particles or heavy metals would fall into the streets. And then when there's a storm event, the water washes out into the river and takes all those heavy metals, which is another non-point source pollutant I didn't mention. Um, so you can really help reduce that by making sure when you buy brake pads for your car, you buy ones that are really low in copper content. And the way you can tell that is if you look on the side of the box, there should be these little leaves. If the leaves are all filled up, like the one on the right, that means it's really low in copper content. So you wanna try to buy the three leaf brakes. And eventually in the United States, these are going to be phased so that they are the only ones that you can buy. But in the meantime, while we're transitioning towards those low copper brakes, you can look for this label and particularly seek them out. We can also reduce the amount of vehicle traffic on our roads. The less traffic there is, um, the less of a transportation system we need in general, less impermeable surfaces in a really large sense. So if we get out on our bikes, we have less impacts from our cars, and maybe we can support a transportation system that has less impermeable surfaces in our region. We can also reduce litter. Every day, this is something we can all help with, is to make sure that if we take our pets for walks, that we're properly cleaning up after them. It may seem like that's a natural thing, too. It's like, oh, not a big deal. When you think about how often dogs go to the bathroom, and if we all leave that, there's an awful lot of pets in our region, and that can accumulate to an awful lot of pet waste washing into our waterways. As we mentioned previously, it has E. coli and salmonella and potential for other diseases that can get into our drinking water source. So it's really important to pick up after your pets and properly dispose of that. We can also pick up other kinds of litter, while we're out on walks and such so that those don't end up in our waterways, they easily wash down the storm drain and end up out in the river. You can help with this by following recycling guides that um, Keep Trucking Meadows Beautiful or KTMB has in our community. This is a great resource. So if you have any kind of trash or things that you pick up, you're not sure how to dispose of or where to recycle it, they have a great guide on their website that you can find out how to dispose of things properly. We can also help 
eliminate the trash and litter by just creating less to begin with, right? And one of the easiest ways we can do this is by using reusable containers, such as reusable water bottles, instead of having plastic containers that get used once and thrown away. And this goes for all single use plastics, essentially. So all those plastic spoons and things, whenever you can use a, one that is reusable instead of one that you're just gonna dispose of once, then there's less potential for plastic pollution to be out there that can wash down and get into the river. Another thing we can all do as individuals is to give responsibly. So if we don't have time to go and do cleanups or volunteer events, but we all still want to have an impact to protect the river, we can responsibly give donations. Um, there are many organizations in our community that you can donate to. In particular, One Truckee River works with the Karma Box Project, and this is to help unsheltered populations in our region. They have little boxes uh, scattered throughout the community where you can make donations of food, other goods, this is really helpful because it gives a designated spot to make those donations and has less potential for them to then uh, get washed away or in the river. Sometimes people will just put like boxes of donations next to the river or in locations where they find unsheltered populations. And while that's nice, there's potential for that to become trash if it's not used or um, disposed of properly. So Karma Box has these locations that are designated that makes it easier for you to donate as well as makes it less potential for those to become contaminants in the river. Another organization that you can donate to that helps with unsheltered population in our area is RISE or Reno Initiative for Shelter and Equality. They have outreach efforts to provide food supplies and emergency shelter for our unsheltered neighbors. They also partner with the Washoe County Human Services to operate Our Place, which is a women's seniors and family community shelter. Another thing that we can do to protect the river is to help or just choose phosphate free cleaning products in general within our homes. So we talked about when you put phosphates down the sewer system, those get treat, cleaned out and treated at the wastewater treatment plant. However, phosphates are pretty complicated to remove or difficult to remove in the wastewater treatment process. So we can save money as a community um, and time with that whole treatment process if we send less phosphates down the sewer system. So when we choose products for laundry or dishwashing, try to choose ones that are phosphate free. We can also use cleaning products in our houses that are less toxic so that those we don't use as toxic chemicals that are getting washed down the drain as well. Also really hard to remove from the water when they go to the treatment plant. So the less toxic things we put down that drain, even though it's going into the, the sewer system where it will get cleaned, the less we put down there that is difficult to remove, the easier it is for the treatment plant to do a good job of returning clean water into the river. We can all also conserve water. The less water we take out of the river, the more is available for the local ecosystem. And one of the things I like to emphasize here is just water usage in the United States. If we compare that to many other regions of the world, we use an awful lot more water in our homes um, and landscapes. So it's really important to think about water conservation that can really help reduce the amount of water that long-term we're gonna take out of the river, especially as we move into the future and water resources in the Western United States become maybe a little more unavailable. Uh, so it can help us all as a community. And when it comes to water conservation, the easiest place to save water in your home is in the bathroom. So toilets and showers are our biggest water users. So if you're gonna do nothing else, I would encourage you to replace your toilet if you don't have a new water efficient uh, one through the WaterSense EPA program is to switch that out for those low flow toilets. And that can save you a lot of money in the long-term as well on your water bills. There's also great resources in our region to learn about water conservation. And one of those is smartaboutwater.com. You can go there for all kinds of resources to learn about water conservation principles. 
So that was a lot of individual actions that you can take to protect the river. Now let's go into ones that you can do in your yard if you have a residential landscape. There are six major principles of river-friendly yards that we try to teach people. The first is to keep water on site. You basically wanna quit watering sidewalks and having all that water flow down the storm drains and out to the river. Easy ways to help eliminate this runoff is to use buffer strips. These are basically planting areas with low water use plants or water wise plants that are put in between the sidewalk and your lawn. So then you move your sprinklers for the lawn away from the sidewalk and we have less potential for sprinkler runoff to go down the drain. We can also use dry creek beds, especially to capture water that comes off of our downspouts from our roofs and sink some of that water on site. We can also use rain gardens or what I like to call mini meadows because we live in the Truckee Meadows. Historically, we had a lot of seasonal wetlands in our region and mini meadows or what other people call rain gardens are essentially just mimicking those seasonal wetlands. So they take the water from your roof, put it into the downspout and drain it out into this little depression or rain garden slash mini meadow where that water can sink down into the soil instead of washing out into the storm drain. We can also use rain barrels to capture some of the water on site and then dole it out and use it on some of our plants. This would not replace an irrigation system in our area. You'd still need to have that. But it, every little drop counts in the desert, and this is an easy way to help keep some of that water on site by storing it and then using it a little later instead of just letting it wash out during a storm event. We can also use products like pervious paving. There's lots of different options. This is an example called pervious concrete. It's basically concrete that doesn't have the sand or fines in it, so it creates pore spaces where the water can flush through. We can also reduce our pollutants. So our second principle is to reduce pollutants. And easy ways to do this is if you have a hot tub or a pool in your backyard, at the end of the summer, you're gonna drain that out um, for the winter, but, and you're allowed to discharge that water into the storm drain system legally. However, you should and are required to dechlorinate it first because those chlorine chemicals that keep things from growing in your hot tub or pool are detrimental to our living aquatic ecosystems in the river. So we don't wanna flush that chlorine out. You just need to go to your spa and pool supply store and get a little dechlorination kit that you mix up and put into the water first before you drain it off. And rather than putting it in the storm drain, if you have somewhere on site to let it drain off and sink into the soil, that's even better. We can also use our fertilizers responsibly. More is not always better. Like we said, if it doesn't get used by the plants, it can wash off all that excess into our waterways that cause algae blooms. So the best practice is to use the right amount for the plants that you're trying to grow and following the instructions carefully on any of those fertilizer products. Uh, we can also reduce the potential for erosion or sediments coming off of our sites by covering the soil. Bare soil is really susceptible to erosion, whereas when you put mulches on top of it, it helps protect it like a nice little blanket. And wood bark mulches are really good for that. Um, do keep in mind though that in our region, we do wanna keep wood bark mulches at least five feet away from the foundation of our homes for fire safety. But out from there, it can be a really good way to cover the soil and protect it from erosion. There's other kinds of mulches that you can use, and those include decomposed granite. This is very common in our region, but I just do want to note that it is a very particle, small particle size as well. So while you might use this as a mulch, you don't want to use it right next to sidewalks or on slopes where it can easily erode. The third principle of river-friendly yards is to use water wisely. We want to make sure that we're not washing or having water come off onto the sidewalks and down the drain. So one of the important things to do is to make sure we're maintaining our irrigation systems and making them as efficient as possible and eliminating any leaks. If you need help to upgrade your irrigation system to make it more efficient and to reduce runoff, recommend that you use a qualified water efficient landscaper or quell professional. 
these people have gone through specific special training to learn how to do irrigation in the most efficient way possible and reduce runoff. And you can find them on quell.net. There's a search button on there where you can put in find a Quell Pro and you put in your zip code so that you can find them. Also recommend following Tumwa or Truckee Meadows Water Authority's watering, even in odd days for your sprinklers. And the part I really like to emphasize is in the bottom right there, and that is to not water when it's windy. When it's windy, all of our sprinkler water <laughs> our irrigation just gets blown off and goes down the drain really easily. So one of the really easy things we can do is just make sure we're watering in the morning when it's less windy. We can also upgrade to technologies and irrigation that use less water, such as drip irrigation, and use water-wise plants that are adapted to our local region and require less water to begin with. The fourth principle of river-friendly yards that we encourage people to think about is building healthy soils. These are the foundation of a healthy landscape. When our soils have lots of organic matter in them, they work like a giant sponge that helps hold water on site. So it can help reduce runoff in that way too. We can increase the organic matter in our soils by composting on site and then adding that finished compost into our landscapes. We can also use grass cycling, which is a strategy where you take the bag off the lawnmower and let small clippings fall in place instead of bagging them up and taking them away. Those small clippings are able to decompose, adding organic matter back into your soil and reducing the need for synthetic fertilizers over time. It does mean that you have to mow more frequently so that you don't do it at a time when the lawn is really thick and you end up with a thatch layer um, of clippings on top. But if you do it and time it properly, then you can reduce your need for fertilizing later. The fifth principle is to create wildlife habitat. And we can do this by providing food, water, and shelter for our feathered friends and beneficial insects. And as this bee points out, another thing we can do is make sure we're not putting down poor seasoning or pesticides on our landscapes to the extent possible. We only want to use this as a last resort to help protect those beneficial insects, wildlife, as well as the mayflies that we talked about that live in the river. This is a strategy called integrated pest management, where you use prevention as your first tier of dealing with pests, and you only use a chemical as a last resort. Using this strategy is a really good way to make sure that you're not having pollutants flow out into the river. The sixth principle of river friendly yards is to prepare for wildfire. And this is because if we have large scale wildfires in our watershed, those can have long term effects on water quality, where sediments and ash and everything off of a burn can wash into the waterways and decrease water quality. So we want to make sure that we're preparing for wildfire, which is part of our local ecology but control it in a way that is small and not large scale and catastrophic where we'll have long-term large water quality impacts. And we can all play a role in this by making sure that we're using firescaping principles, especially if you live in that wildland urban um, interface where you're on the edge of town and more susceptible to risk of wildfire coming into your property. And you can use the different principles of creating defensive space with the different zones. And we really try to encourage using rain gardens and other strategies for sinking water in on site in that zone closer to your home, not at, right at the foundation, but close enough to help keep water on site and make the vegetation there less dry and susceptible to fire. So we've covered how you can do individual actions in your everyday life and also all kinds of principles that you can incorporate into your landscape to make them river friendly. The last thing we wanna emphasize is that there's lots of things you can do by just raising your voice and hands to speak up for the river in our community. An easy way to do this is to volunteer whenever you have the opportunity. There's lots of different organizations you can volunteer with to help the Truckee River in our region. One is Keep Truckee Meadows Beautiful. They do a Truckee River cleanup every year in September. You can volunteer for that event they have sites all along the river where you can help clean up and remove uh, trash and litter. 
and help um, reduce invasive species along the river as well. Truckee Meadows Parks Foundation also has a doggy ambassador program. And this is a really fun one, especially if you're a dog lover. Basically, you volunteer, you pick or you get assigned a park and a location of a doggy bag location where you're responsible for making sure that that stays full so that there's always doggy bags available in our local parks for people to use. You can also get informed and involved in our local public process. And I'm gonna go through a couple of examples that are local issues that are currently going on in the fall of 2022. This can change over time, obviously, as things change in our community, there are different initiatives to get involved with, but we just want to give you kind of an update for right now. And just keep in mind that if you're watching this video in the future and these don't apply, there's always new initiatives that you can look into and get involved in in your local community to use your voice and help speak up for the river. One that's currently going on that you can get involved in is the Washoe County Master Plan Update. This is called the Washoe 2040 or Envision Washoe 2040. And this update to the master plan is ongoing currently. You can go to the county's website and you can input in questionnaires and also give comments on how, what you'd like to see in that overall master plan for how we develop the county into the future. The Truckee Meadows Regional Planning Agency also has an initiative going on right now to update their natural resources plan. Uh, this was for an event earlier this fall, but there's still ongoing outreach and ways that you can get involved. Just go to their website so that you can give input on how our natural resources should be planned into the future for our region. The city of Reno is also proposing a stormwater utility. This is a proposed fee dedicated to stormwater infrastructure. So stormwater operations are currently funded through our city sewer bill. A portion of that sewer bill is then used to maintain the storm drain system, which as we talked about before, are separate systems. But that funding currently is not enough. It's not keeping up with the demands. Um, that storm drain system is extensive, especially as we've grown in our region and it's gotten larger. There's more storm drain infrastructure and there's historic flooding and issues that aren't being addressed because they don't have enough funding to improve that system. So this is proposed to create a separate funding source that's specific to the storm drain system. Would ensure that the city has funding to implement its stormwater and flood control program needs. It is very similar to programs in other cities. They already have a similar fee in Carson City and Sparks, so it's not an anomaly for our region. And it's currently pending public input and council vote in 2023. So if this is something that you would like to give input on, you can visit the city of Reno's website, just search for stormwater utility, and you can find out a lot more information about this and how the fee will be structured and it may affect you. And you can give input on how you'd like to see that implemented. And there's also lots of ways to get involved and stay up to date with what's going on in our community, new initiatives as they come up. We encourage you to follow us on social media on Facebook and Instagram. And you can, of course, visit our website and donate to One Truckee River in order to make sure that we are also working on being the voice for the river in our community as well. So to wrap it up, let's review and test your knowledge. What did you learn during this class? Can you tell me what are some river-friendly individual actions that you can take to help protect the Truckee River? Think about it for a second. So some river-friendly individual actions that you can take can be easy things like taking your car to the car wash instead of washing it in the driveway, picking up pet waste when you take your dog for a walk, picking up litter and maybe just reducing plastic usage in general in your life, like using reusable water bottles and spoons and utensils instead of single use plastics, using phosphate free soaps in your homes. So there's lots of ways in your individual day. Oh, and just reducing your transportation impacts, which means trying to ride your bike more often or use car less. All of those things can help protect the Truckee River in your daily life. 
Next one, what are some river friendly yard strategies that you can incorporate that would help protect the Truckee River from afar? No matter where you live in the watershed, remember your yard is actually connected to the Truckee River. So things that you can do, can you think of any that would help protect the river? A few seconds to think about it. So some of the things we learned about in this class are using things like buffer strips and putting plants in between the lawn and our sidewalks so that we move those sprinklers away so we don't get runoff there. Using fertilizers responsibly, using new technologies and irrigation that are water conserving and reduce runoff. Uh, we can also try things like rain barrels or mini meadows and dry creek beds to soak up water on site. There are many different strategies. Reusing compost in your yard to fortify your soil so they have more organic matter and work like a giant sponge to help hold water on site. So many things to think about in our yards that can help protect the Truckee River. How can you use your river-friendly voice and hands? Give you a second to think about that one. Some of the things that we learned about in this class are that we can volunteer with different organizations such as Keep Truckee Meadows Beautiful and their Truckee River Cleanup every year. We can also get involved in local initiatives and use our voice to help protect the Truckee River. Since it can't speak for itself, you can be its voice in the public input process. We discussed some local initiatives that are going on currently in the fall of 2022, but as those shift and change, there are always different things that are going on in our community where you can be the voice for the river and help speak up to make sure that we're protecting it for ourselves today and our future generations. That, thank you very much for attending this class. Just a general disclaimer that this information is for educational use only. Use it at your own risk. Make sure you follow local codes and ordinances. And of course, always consult with professionals, especially on the river friendly yards part if you're incorporating anything new into your landscape that you're unsure of or need help with. Uh, thank you for joining us for this class. We hope you've learned a lot about how to protect the Truckee River in your daily life. 